You are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Greetings, fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another Catholic Quick Take. On the feast of St. Mary Cleophas, the other Mary. She is rather the mystery Mary, isn't she? Usually referred to as the other Mary, she is mentioned only once by name in the scriptures. In the Gospel of St. John, just before our Lord gives his blessed mother into his care, St. John tells us, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. We are, of course, well acquainted with Mary the mother of God, and Mary Magdalene the penitent is a well-known figure in the stories of the saints. But who is St. Mary Cleophas? And, wait a minute, she was the blessed mother's sister? The fact is, we know very little about Mary Cleophas outside of a couple mentions in the Bible and a limited amount of genealogy. St. Jerome tells us that St. James the Lesser, St. Simon, St. Jude, and another brother named Joseph or Joseph, who was a follower but not an apostle, were sons of Mary of Cleophas. And her husband Cleophas, referred to in some texts as Clopas, was the brother of St. Joseph which made these four men the first cousins of Jesus. The genealogical terms used to explain their relationships to one another have confused folks through the centuries, but it's quite clear to the early translators, including the great Saint Jerome, Mary Cleophas is called the sister of Mary, and his cousins are called the brothers of Jesus, actually mistakenly, because the translation from Hebrew and Latin to, well, every language under the sun, corrupted a general term to a specific one. The original words the evangelists would have used came closer to meaning a close relative, a general description, not specific like brother or sister. To be exact, Mary of Cleophas was actually the Blessed Mother's sister-in-law. Now to untangle some other common confusions. We might want to mention another Mary you may remember from your readings about the Passion, Mary Salome. This Salome has nothing to do with St. John the Baptist, in case anyone was wondering. Salome is just another one of those popular names of biblical times, like Mary. Sometimes referred to as just Salome, this Mary is recorded by St. Mark as one of the women who accompanied Mary Cleophas and Mary Magdalene, bringing spices to our Lord's tomb on the third day. This Mary, Mary Salome, is the mother of St. John the Beloved and St. James the Greater, the sons of thunder. So Mary Salome was the wife of thunder. And I don't know about you, but I would like to know more about this guy thunder, actually named Zebedee. He must have been quite the fellow to have gotten such a nickname from Jesus himself. Anyway, it's commonly believed that Mary Salome was the daughter of Mary Cleophas, which would make St. James the Lesser, St. Simon and St. Jude, Mary Cleophas's sons, and Saints John and James the Greater, her grandsons. If you're wondering why St. James the Lesser was older than St. James the Greater, so am I. We may have to tackle that one on one of their feast days. St. Mary Cleophas, then, Jesus' aunt, accompanied her grandson, St. John, and her sister-in-law, the Blessed Virgin Mary, up the hill of Calvary, and stood at the foot of the cross those agonizing three hours until the death of our Lord and then was intimately involved with the details of his burial. If St. John was her grandson, I think it's safe to say that Mary Cleophas was the oldest of the Marys. From what I know of grandmothers, I imagine it might have been she who carried extra handkerchiefs with her, and who may have tried to see to many of the practicalities of this tragic day. We can't know, but I can almost feel her relief and her pride that young John has followed the cross with them to Calvary out of love for Jesus, and because he knew he needed to support the moms. I can imagine his grandmother's accompanying sorrow, too, knowing he was the only apostle that came. So much sorrow. Sorrow for the fear of the other ten apostles. Sorrow for the broken heart of her sister-in-law, Jesus' holy mother. Sorrow for the evil cruelty of the soldiers and the mocking crowd. Sorrow, most of all, for the pitiful, mangled body of Christ. Every stone underfoot, 
every breath taken, every thought must have been saturated in sorrow. It's pretty certain that St. Mary Cleophas would have been well aware that she had just witnessed the ignominious death of the Son of God. But she would also have recognized in the bruised and bleeding figure before her, her nephew, Jesus, whom she'd known since his infancy. He was literally family. And being family, it stood to reason that St. Mary Cleophas, with Jesus' cousin St. Mary Salome, and with St. Mary Magdalene, would have taken on the task of the final preparation of Jesus' body, and that they would be the ones recorded as having first seen our risen Savior. It seems somehow fitting, doesn't it, that God rewarded these valiant women, one of them the model of penitence, two of them the mothers of five of his apostles, the joy and consolation of getting to see him first. Or second, it's a pious belief that our Lord appeared first to his mother, but we won't know this for sure until we see the beatific vision ourselves. Isn't it typical of Our Lady's humility, though, that she would keep such a visitation hidden in her heart? St. Mary Cleophas is not mentioned again in Scripture, but there is a long tradition in the Church that the three Marys, Mary Cleophas, Mary Salome, and Mary Magdalene, together with St. Martha and some of the other holy women followers of Christ, were swept up in the Jewish persecution of the Christians. Fourteen years after the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, in the year 47, as punishment for their continued stalwart profession of the faith, it is said that these holy women were placed together in a small boat with no oars or sails, towed out to sea, and left, or so the Jews thought, to die, pray to the elements or starvation, whichever came first. But is there any question that the fisher of men would allow such a thing to happen? Of course he wouldn't. After a miraculous journey of over 3,500 miles across the Mediterranean Sea, skirting around the toe of Italy and the football of Sicily, the ladies landed on an island in the south of France, later named in their honor saint marie de la Mer, or the Holy Marys of the Sea. You might remember that St. Mary Magdalene lived out the end of her life doing penance in a remote cave hermitage, but did you know that the cave was in the south of France? St. Mary Cleophas, St. Mary Salome, and the other holy women are reported in some legends to have settled in different areas of France. Their prayers and sacrifices, the seeds of the holy vocations to come for the oldest daughter of the church. Nothing specific is recorded of the remainder of the three Marys' lives or the dates of their deaths, but their relics, rediscovered in the 15th century, are enshrined in the beautiful church fortress in the heart of the city of San Marie de la Mer, and the three St. Marys are venerated there to this day. Traditionally, the relics are taken down from their reliquary high in the church and displayed on the altar on each of the three feast days, and in a unique ceremony, Three ancient statues of the saints are placed in a beautifully decorated boat, which is carried on the shoulders of the men of the parish, and solemnly processed to the seaside and back. A wonderful tradition I would love to follow in this procession, but as far as I know, this local celebration is the only attention really paid to this grandmother saint who played such an important role in the most important three days in the history of mankind. Not that she'd expect honors, mind you, not that she'd care. St. Mary Cleophas received the greatest honor that could be bestowed on a person, being permitted to be one of the first to see the risen Christ. After that, worldly recognition would be anticlimactic at best. Standing at the foot of the cross with the Blessed Mother would have already placed the world and all its honors and temptations outside her peripheral vision, and any notions of pride or human respect she might have still had, holy woman that she was, would have already been washed away with her tears. She was uniquely prepared in this way to see Christ. She is a lesson to all of us. You've been listening to the Catholic Family Podcast. If you enjoyed this show, please share it with your friends and family. You can support the production on Patreon and PayPal, and you can reach Kevin at kevin89davis at gmail.com. Ad maiorem de gloriam. All for the greater glory of God.